have this new novel called Skinny, and I'm going to read from it tonight. It's set at a weight loss camp in North Carolina, and it's narrated by Gray Lockman, who is a 27-year-old, um, well, counselor now at a weight loss camp, and she is um, a binge eater, compulsive eater, whatever you want to call her, and she's hoping this summer to overcome that. So I'm going to read ch uh, chapters one and two, or excerpts from chapters one and two, and then a very brief chapter five. One. After I killed my father, he taught me that honesty is optional. But of course, I'd always known that. This was why I loathed being naked. My choices were stripped away. It was the first day of staff training, and I was naked among strangers. Well, naked enough. We all whispered, I feel so naked, and giggled, awaiting commiseration, because who wants to be the most naked person to let her body blab her secrets? We stood in bathing suits and flip-flops. We were goosebumps sheathed in towels. We were vulnerable knees, scars with stories, fading bruises. February flesh. We were yellow-tinged toenails, awkward tattoos, scratched mosquito bites, suspicious moles. We were shamefully unshaven. We were birthmarks meant for lovers. We were eyes stealing glances. We were eyes pretending not to steal glances. Lewis was calling my name. We were gathered in the politely dim student lounge, which Lewis called the canteen. I separated from the group that was clustered around a bar with no stools, no bottles, no bartender, and walked to the middle of the lounge where Lewis stood with the nurse, an obese woman who had told us to call her nurse, whose shiny beige leggings carried her cellulite like tight sacks of oatmeal. Nurse was holding a noose of tape measure around the nutritionist's neck. As I approached, Lewis watched me watch him. The picture of him on the Camp Carolina website, a head and shoulders shot, had depicted a much thinner man. In fact, his face was relatively thin, saggy at the neck, but narrow, clean shaven, punctuated by wire-rimmed glasses and a gray helmet of hair with a widow's peak so perfect, his forehead was shaped like the top of a heart. It was the middle of his body that betrayed him, like the hoop inside a clown suit. Gray Lockman, he swept an arm across his body and bowed. Gray from New York City. Such a sad name, nurse said, clucking her tongue. She shook her head and her chin flapped. Come here, honey. For an alarming moment, I looked at her outstretched arms and thought that she wanted to hug me to ease the ache of my lackluster name, but then she let the tape measure unfurl from her hand. Let's see what you add up to. Nurse wrapped the tape measure around each of my arms, my waist, my hips. She whispered, these leggings give me a wedgie. She scribbled something on a clipboard. I let my towel fall to the floor, stepped out of my flip-flops, and stood against a wall. My bathing suit was a brown one-piece, as discreet as a loincloth. I tried to remember more naked moments, but even the night I'd lost my virginity, I'd been wearing a sweatshirt and also had been spectacularly drunk. No, this was the moment. This was it. No one had ever been more naked than this. I grew up in New York, Lewis said, aiming his camera at me. I smiled into the flash. In my heart, I'll always be a New Yorker. I envisioned him running to catch a taxi, his balloon belly bouncing, his silver whistle knocking against his chest. I used to eat at Luigi's in the theater district, back when I was a binge eater, Lewis chuckled. They have eggplant parm as big as your head. It's worth going. He motioned for me to step on the scale at his feet, just for the eggplant. It falls over the edges of the plate. How tall are you? Five, four? I watched him punch numbers into a handheld device attached to the scale by a long wire. 
You're hardly fat at all, he diagnosed. And for some reason, I remembered my father stealing fries from my plate, poking them into his mouth, saying, you and your mother with your french fry aversions, look what you make me do. Then to whoever else was in earshot, and they wonder why I'm fat, these women. Are you going to... Lewis scrunched his brow as if trying to remember something he'd read. Are you going to surrender to my program? I could have answered him honestly. I didn't fancy myself the surrender in kind. I recoiled to think of abandoning control, of being caught under the arms and dragged someplace to rest. But the problem with the truth was that inside it lay another truth. And inside that, another truth, like those wooden Russian nesting dolls. So instead I asked, the diet the kids are doing? I pulled my towel tighter on my chest, letting my stomach muscles relax just a bit. I said cheerfully, everyone has to start somewhere. In the past year, I had grown dependent on platitudes. That's neither here nor there. Que sera, sera. People always agreed. They sighed and nodded their heads and said, that's for damn sure. If there was one thing they knew how to spot, it was wisdom. That's what I always say, Lewis rubbed his belly sagely. Everyone has to start somewhere. Two. Mostly, I was not a dishonest person. I had never shoplifted or copied answers on a test. Back in New York, when I felt like breaking plans, I told friends, I'm staying in tonight, instead of doing what most people did, which was pretend to have a catastrophic disease. And I had been with Mikey for five years without cheating, ever since I met him outside Big Apple Comedy Club. I was different then, 15 pounds lighter, a girl with a father, a girl with a stupid office job, and I was so militantly in love with New York City, I once spent a Sunday on the double-decker tourist bus. Mikey was different then, too. A new Jack, fresh out of the box, selling tickets for his own shows in the street. I noticed him before he noticed me. I was walking aimlessly through the West Village alone because I loved Manhattan and its infinite channels. A guy in a red Big Apple Comedy Club t-shirt stood blocking the sidewalk. He was remarkably large, but not large like my father. My father was the fattest person I knew. I'd seen fatter people on television and in the Guinness Book of World Records, like the man who could get through a doorway only if he was buttered, and in person too, but they were usually confined to wheelchairs. By contrast, my father was active. He was no triathlete, but he cannonballed into swimming pools, and at weddings, he did the twist so low his knees would crack audibly. When he waltzed my mother around the living room, she vanished, tiny and insignificant, against his great belly, his sweating round head, his mammoth hands. This guy in the street wasn't fat. He was a relatively healthy-looking giant and his presence was more assailable than my father's. He looked overgrown, a vegetable that should have been picked and was now too ripe. You like stand-up comedy, he asked me. It was what he was asking everyone. He sounded distracted. I couldn't possibly have appreciated the weight of his question. Had he asked me something more direct, like, would you like me to change the course of your life? I would have whacked him with my purse, shouted no, and run. But I said, I love stand-up comedy. I could see in his brown eyes that he knew how to flirt. That was all it was. I wanted to be flirted with. I wanted to pet his wild black hair. I was 22, and I didn't know anything. In those first months with Mikey, I always ran the last few blocks to his apartment because I couldn't get to him quickly enough. I spent hours in St. Mark's bookshop, poring over books he had mentioned, books about Taoism and Steve Martin and disasters that might end the world. In the years that followed, I was a faithful girlfriend, 
guilty of only the most minor transgressions. A kiss in the back of a comedy club, for example, a few months before I left for camp. Mikey was on stage when it happened, the spotlight in his eyes. He was doing a bit he'd been working on for weeks, a joke about his girlfriend's father dying. It wasn't funny yet. Sometimes jokes took months to smooth out. This one still had wrinkles. I was sitting beside an older comic who had just been on Conan O'Brien and always wore a fedora on stage. A guy full of a bravado particular to men with above average access to sex. He leaned into me and tipped his hat. He whispered, if you don't mind my saying so, your boyfriend's a douche. <laughs> I whispered, I mind your saying so. But when he pressed his mouth to mine, I let him. I was sick of Mikey's dead father joke. And there were many men in many bars. Can I buy you a drink? So what's your story? Men in suits and loosened ties, exhausted bankers, big single malts, men from whom I would slip away while they checked the score or flagged the bartender, men who touched my necklaces, their knuckles brushing my collarbones. I loved tired men with needy hands. And who's to say Mikey was the perfect boyfriend? I knew how things went in the comedy clubs. After shows, girls stood outside smoking and fixing their bangs. Or they ordered vodka sodas and lingered at their tables. They told Mikey, you were so funny. They thought they'd found the key to happiness, a boyfriend who could make them laugh. They said, I loved your joke about traffic. I loved your joke about the president. I loved when you said that thing to that person in the audience about his ugly sweater. They got up close to him and thrust out their chests. They smoothed, smoothed their shiny hair over their hopeful shoulders. But none of that matters. I know that. I do. What Mikey might have or might not have done, that doesn't matter at all.